So we'll spend just a little bit of time talking about radiation dose limits. This should be available on Moodle. And then after this, we'll have a, a discussion of NCRP report number 160 um, and why it's important. So this is chapter 10. And the big thing here is that dose limits, for our purposes, occupational or public health reasons, both of them are based on risk. And so we've talked quite a bit this trimester about risk estimates, what kinds of risks are we dealing with, and how those risks are modeled. Here's some objectives that I have for us for today. Um, we will define the various uh, standard or standardizing organizations. We'll look at regulatory organizations. Um, we'll review the goals of radiation protection standards, and we'll discuss some various scenarios, right? Because this stuff, honestly, the way it's presented in our textbooks is a little dry. Just talking about these different regulatory bodies and things is a little dry. When in reality, this stuff is quite interesting. There's a lot of politics involved in this. Um, even with like board, uh, big bodies like the United Nations, there's controversy about some of the questions that they have. There's also controversy around some of the science. So um, I'll make sure to kind of bring that home to us in our departments and what that looks like for us in the hospitals. So, these uh, standards organizations, right? And these are organizations, they are not regulatory bodies. I can't stress that enough. These are not organizations that are making regulations. They're not making laws. They're not making policies. They're just doing the research. These are scientists who are out there doing the research and saying, okay, we've noticed this response when a population receives this amount of radiation, right? So one of the big ones of that is the ICRP. Um, the International Committee on Radiation Protection, um, and uh, they are um, maybe International Commission for Radiologic Protection. They they do um, information on all these biological um, and general recommendations about radiation exposure. And so it's not just medicine. They're looking at nuclear power. They're, nuclear, they're looking at nuclear weapons. They're looking at um, cos cosmic radiation, terrestrial radiation, the radiation that you get from eating a banana. All of that kind of exposure they are interested in, and they are doing the hard science on, okay, what does this do in terms of biological systems? When we're looking at globally people's... Uh, the biological responses to radiation. So we don't work a lot with the ICRP, and in fact, there's some ways that the NCRP is quite different from the ICRP. Like, for example, until recently, the NCRP reported everything in RIMS and Rankins and RADS, right? The ICRP reports everything in sieverts and um, gray and, and coulombs per kilogram. Uh, also, the ICRP has made changes for what their occupational dose limit recommendations are, and the NCRP has yet to, to adopt those changes. So um, there's a number of ways that they differ. The NCRP, nevertheless, is going to take the information not just from the NCRP, I'm sorry, not just from the ICRP, but from uh, UN Skier and Beer and a number of other sci scientific studies, and they're going to evaluate that. And they're also going to apply it to the United States population. So the NCRP is within the United States, and they're going to review these standards that are, that are published by the ICRP and decide whether or not those should be recommendations for U.S. policymaking. So they're not making the policy, but they are going to be making recommendations. Right? Um, UN Skier is the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation. And so this is the UN now, the United Nations, all these, all these uh, countries that have united and say, we'll, we'll share regulations, we'll share, we'll have some transparency in, in the way that we're doing our science. Um, I, I can't stress this enough. These people have an agenda, right? I think about the ICRP being fairly scientific in the way that they do things, and frankly, the NCRP has a slight agenda because they're dealing with just the United States population. UNSCEAR does have an agenda, and so they choose to report certain things, and they choose not to report certain things. Um, like, for example, when we looked at that video, um, Pandora's Promise, there was that very angry older woman who was claiming that the UN had obscured data from Chernobyl. Right? 
that Chernobyl had been much more catastrophic and had affected the lives of, of many more people than the UN was letting on. That probably is true, right? Um, but at the same time, is it as cataclysmic as this lady is making it out to be? Probably not. So they do have an agenda. They do report things uh, as appropriately as they can. But they're looking at human health and environmental ioniz ionizing radiation from a national point of view, from international organizations, international policies, and politics, and there's a political arm to it, right? So they're not making recommendations, but, for example, I mean, U.S. attacks on Iraq or something were in part um, informed by information from UN Skier. Finally, BEER, um, which is typically the way I, I shorten it, the National Academy of Sciences, and specifically their Council on the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. So this is, again, a scientific body, and this is a purely scientific body, but if you want to think about it in terms of do, do they have an agenda or not, they may have an agenda. I have a difficult time. I've not yet found any information from beer that seems really controversial to me. Um, so they, for the most part, are the people who are providing funding for scientists here in the United States who are researching this stuff. So again, these are the standardizing organizations. They are just scientists who figure out things. Sometimes scientists have an agenda, sometimes they don't, but they don't have the ability to make policy. These are regulatory organizations. So these are, poli these are policy and law-making organizations. These are the people that if you take a patient off or if you do something wrong, these are the people that could wind up, you know, taking millions of dollars from your organization or you yourself, um, and you could potentially lose your license if you tangle with these people and they're in a bad mood, okay? So the, the, the big one for us is the NRC, okay? Um, and the, what the NRC is responsible for largely is nuclear energy, radioisotopes, okay? Um, and so they work with agreement states, like a states who have said, well, look, we'll do all that you're saying do, to do, NRC. And they're the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We'll do everything that you say you're going to do. And so they will mo those agreement states will monitor these regulations on their own. Other states, if they're not in agreement with it, it'll be split. It'll split duty between the NRC and that state. Okay? And the big thing that the NRC is responsible for in terms of our healthcare organizations is radiation safety councils. Okay? The Radiation Safety Council, the, R, the RSC, right, for your hospital, is a requirement of the NRC. They require, if your hospital is going to be, if they're going to be handling radiopharmaceuticals, they have to have um, an RSC, a Radiation Safety Council. And that committee will, will have um, an RSO, Radiation Safety Officer. They will have a nurse. They will have representatives from the imaging sciences. Right? And they have very specific people that should be in attendance there. You don't need to memorize that. Our textbook doesn't go into all that detail there. But just know that if you are working in an organization that has a radiation safety committee, that is a requirement of the NRC for any organization that's playing around with radiopharmaceuticals. Okay? So that is impactful in the PBL that we're going to be looking at in a minute. Okay? Um, and then the, typically one of the main ways that the RSC interfaces with us as workaday x-ray techs and nuke med techs and radiation therapists is um, investigation levels. They will establish within that hospital, okay, if we have a patient that is exposed to X amount of radiation, then we were going to investigate that. We're going to call that a sentinel event, okay? A sentinel event is a generic term. We can have all sorts of different kinds of sentinel events. You know, we could have sentinel events related to CT contrast. We could have sentinel events related to just medications that a patient received. But when we're dealing with a radiation sentinel event, the body that will be examining that in most organizations is the RSC, the Radiation Safety Committee. Now, the EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency, and so again, they are the people who get to go around and do the reviews of, like, of radioactive sewer sludge, 
Like if your patient takes a radioactive poop in your toilet, the EPA are the people who get to figure that out. It sounds like a really fun job to be a part of, right? They're also going to be the people that are monitoring. So um, radio pharmaceuticals being transported to the hospital, the EPA and the Department of Transportation are going to be monitoring the movement of radio pharmaceuticals down highways and across cities and things like that, as well as uh, radioactive waste management, um, radioactive uh, decay products from different industrial processes, all those kinds of things. So they're not super impactful to us. The one that we do need to remember, especially as therapists and x-ray techs, is the FDA. Because strangely enough, the Food and Drug Administration is the organization that um, conducts ongoing product reviews and regulations and specifications for anything that produces diagnostic and therapeutic x-rays. So the Food and Drug Administration, strangely enough, is the organization that makes sure that your x-ray machine works appropriately. Okay? Not the NRC, the FDA. And then finally, OSHA used to be much more impactful to us when we had things like dark rooms and we had to be concerned about chemical exposure in addition to x-ray exposure. But OSHA still plays a small part in um, maintaining occupational safety, and particularly the, patient, the fact that the employees have a right to know um, with regard to any kind of workplace hazard. Okay? You have a right to know as an employee, and so OSHA, largely OSHA, their impact on us is there's always that piece of paper in the break room that says like, that you have a right to know something about what's <laughs> happening in your department. So what are the goals of all these standardizations and regulations, right? And this comes from NCRP report number 116, that to pre the goals are to prevent the occurrence of serious radiation-induced conditions, and those can be acute or chronic, in an exposed persons, and to reduce stochastic effects in exposed persons to a degree that is acceptable in relation to the benefits the individual and to society from the activities that generate such exposures, right? And again, this is that ethical statement that's just much more wordy, but it is talking about risks versus benefits, right? What are the risks? We acknowledge that they're stochastic as well as deterministic. And then what are the benefits? Interestingly enough, you as x-ray techs and nuke med techs and radiation therapists are the only people, right, that these regulatory bodies allow to willfully expose the general public to radiation. A nuclear power plant cannot say, okay, well, we're going to expose a few people to radiation now with this next thing that we're going to do. No, they can't do that. No part of industry, no part of, honestly, even the military can willfully expose the general public to radiation, but you can't. So it makes us a little bit the exception to the rule in certain ways, and so we'll be looking at that some more. On page 224 in our textbook, table 10-3, um, did I write that? I may have put that number down wrong. Table 10-3, yeah, thank you. These are the areas of this table that I'm interested in you knowing, okay? Um, section A, anything that's an occupational exposure. Okay, so our effective dose limits, the an so annual effective dose limit, as well as how to calculate a cumulative effective dose limit, the equivalent dose to um, the lens of the eye, as well as the localized areas of the skin, hands, feet. Okay, we need to know all of those numbers. Under Section C, I just want you to know what is the effective dose limit to the public. One mil it's one millisiever. Right? Likewise, for you, y'all are provisioned by Section D. The effective dose limit to students is also one millisiever per year. And then finally, these um, embryo and fetus exposures. What is the monthly? What is the full term of pregnancy, what are those dose limits? And then it is helpful to also know what is considered negligible. Like what is not a dose amount that we have to be concerned with? And so that is the point 
zero one millisieverts. We are not concerned with like I guess that could be ten microsieverts of exposure. So here are some scenarios 